ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of So You Want to Optimize! First up, the design phase. Don't get too comfortable, folks, because for those of you who get past the first step, debug and bring up is next. And that one is a doozy. <laughs> okay, no, this is just Jock Doc. Show me an engineer who doesn't like knobs and buttons, tweaking this and that, and fine-tuning just about anything. Sure, the days of knobs and buttons may be a bit behind us now, but the days of optimization, especially in the realm of IC design, has really started to get exciting. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Optimization in terms of IC design does not need to stop at the design phase. It can be extremely valuable throughout the life cycle of the chip itself. In this second episode in this Chalk Talk series about silicon life cycle management, Stephen Crosher from Synopsys joins me to take a closer look at in-chip and PVT monitoring, how it can not only help with the complexity of the design of the chip, but also in its scalability, its reliability in the field, and much more. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Synopsys. Hi, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Emilio. It's a pleasure to be here. So with today's advanced nodes, the need for silicon lifecycle management is becoming more and more important, right? But when we're talking about visibility within that life cycle, what are we really looking at? Yeah, so just to sort of frame what's happening in the industry at the moment, because I think it's important just to make mention of that, is that the industry is evolving quite rapidly in this space. And we've seen through some recent acquisitions, the kind of keen intent we're seeing from some of the big players out there to be a part of this. And really the opportunity there is to see within the chip at different stages information that wouldn't otherwise be available and that's information that can be presented at each phase so from design through to manufacture through to test through to deployment and through to in field we're able to start to gather information from sensors that allow us to either optimize designs and devices and their operation in real time in mission mode or to improve upon on their reliability and I think the key thing we're seeing here is that there's a lot of these aspects in terms of in-chip monitoring data being presented from those monitors and metrics on manufacture and data sets from production test and then in field we have a lot of data that could be available and be made available for analytics is that we're not seeing everything completely connected up today. I think this is where the opportunity lies to have these dots connected. And uh, I think that's the exciting thing we see about life cycle visibility of silicon throughout its lifetime. So Stephen, can you walk me through how monitors and analytics play a role in this kind of system? So, so far we've been using sensors in chip for in-field purposes predominantly. So that allows us to do some changes on the fly in terms of altering the operation of the chip, depending on certain dynamic conditions that are going on inside, you know, and we'll get to that in just a moment about the sort of different thermal and supply conditions that we might see. So that's where we've traditionally been, but what we're starting to see is there's more useful sources of data that we can extract and that in its in turn feeds into analytics. And so we can see opportunities there to refine the design process. So if we're taking parameters from the manufacturing steps and feeding that back into design to tighten design constraints, we can also see that we can adapt test depending on how silicon is, is passing certain criteria. We can also see that there's test information that we can, can extract for, for benefit in terms of screening and selection of devices. And then we can also see in the field itself an opportunity not just to optimize at a chip level, but also at a product wide level. So steering entire fleets of product that may be out there. 
And with that, and because we're able to gather this data and see sort of trends that are occurring uh, within the silicon and within the deployed fleet of silicon, if you like, we're able to start to see when devices may need maintenance or when they may need removal from the field, you know, so we're starting to see predictions of failure occurring before it actually happens. That's cool. Now, Stephen, I'm especially interested in the real-time process and voltage and thermal analysis of the system. Can you explain that part of the process a bit? Yeah, so real-time by its definition is very much in mission mode. So for that, we're often looking at optimization of devices. And this is a well-established technology. We have been doing this and developing our sensors and sensor subsystem that gets embedded deep within the chip for many years now. And I, I believe we've now become a go-to solution for that. And so we see, for example, within the subsystem, we have process monitors, we have thermal sensors, and we have supply monitors. And if we just take the example of process monitors, the advanced nodes are becoming more complex. We're seeing more variability. And so we're seeing that there's an opportunity for, for greater process monitoring that can apply itself in terms of if you are able to understand how the chip is made and, and have a better understanding of that, you're able to select silicon for particular applications. You know, So basically an advanced or enhanced way of binning devices to maybe high-end applications or maybe low-end or lower-end applications for battery, maybe consumer uh, sort of devices. So there's a whole host of other things that we're seeing as opportunities, and that can include normalization of silicon. So you can start to vary supplies. If you've got fast device, you can vary the supply down. If you have slow devices, you can speed them up or, or increase the supply, I should say. We can also see that understanding how the chip is made, you can start to create these operation profiles of voltage and frequency. So you can kind of have a high performance, high energy, high power, high activity profile for a particular chip. And then you can have a low power optimized on supply profile of the chip if it's going to a particular power sensitive application. So, Stephen, with FinFETs and today's more advanced nodes, they present us with a unique set of challenges, right? What are the specific issues we're looking to solve here? I'd say there are three big challenges. Number one is transistor scaling, just scaling of devices. So gate density increasing and we've seen that increase dramatically especially across the finfet nodes down from 16 nanometer down to 3 nanometer and so that presents a challenge in many ways secondly i would say complexity within the chip so we're seeing higher levels of interconnect and uh, simply gate count within certain constrained areas of the device and then thirdly i'd say complexity of systems there's an emergence of 2.5D, 3D chiplets going into a single system. So that's just compounding the issues of complexity. And with complexity, you often see issues associated with high chance of defects. The whole manufacturing process in turn becomes that much more complex. So that can relate to reliability and how that impacts on you know, maybe reliable or reliability sensitive applications such as automotive for example. And the other part of it is that a chip that's in operation and what I term as the as the silicon scape, if you were to look across silicon or silicon die somehow, you'd see that there's a lot of activity in terms of hotspots flaring up. You'd see uh, supplies changing, you'd see supplies drooping, you'd see IR drops, just generally due to that incredible amount of activity that's going on in, in some of these very advanced node silicon devices. Okay, so Stephen, can we walk through each part of PVT? Process monitoring is first, right? Process monitoring is often listed first because of PVT. Uh, just as simple as that. It's the P that comes first. Um, but yeah, that's uh, in essence has been around for quite a while, you know, a good number of years, if not a few decades in looking at things like uh, uh, speed of devices using uh, ring oscillators or delay chains. But obviously that has been expanded upon over the years. Just as an aside, I would say that the individual PVT components as sensors are now critical to the operation of 
devices. And I say the operation, not just performance, but also its operation. These IPs are now very much required. But in terms of process, yeah, we can see how the chip is essentially made and then we can respond to that. And then we provide best profile operation modes for that particular chip. And I think that's where the big opportunity is. It's optimizing per chip, which is, as I say, it's either through speed data throughput, that type of performance, or it's a power performance. A couple of other areas we see with process monitoring is to look at the degradation of silicon. And that's a, that's a big topic at the moment. And obviously we're deploying and sending out into the field, you know, seven, five nanometer and, and not into the too distant future, three nanometer. And of course, we have only really got information over the last few years if, if, for example, we're looking at, say, 7 nanometer. And that's still quite a short time. So we still need to understand how aging and degradation is happening. So having these monitors in place help us do that. One last point I'd want to make about process monitoring and where we see an expansion is looking at critical path analysis. So knowing your margins of operation, I think is going to become an incredibly interesting topic going forward in terms of embedded sensing. Absolutely. Now, Stephen, what about the voltage part of PVT? I would imagine that advanced nodes have unique challenges in this arena as well. Yeah, well, with every new node that comes out, there's a reduction in supplies and the interconnect complexity is increasing and we see that that then poses resistive issues through the design. So for example, if you're looking at IR drop and the uh, power grid across a chip, that does have an impact. We're generally seeing the reduction in supply. So basically the overhead and the headroom for the logic is starting to diminish. So we're getting a little bit closer to reasonable operation for the logic. Plus we have this desire to just reduce supplies as a part of the normal operation of the chip. So if you're applying adaptive voltage scaling schemes, for example, where you're trying to crunch down the core supply levels, it just starts to compound those issues. And of course, there's great benefit if you can bring those supplies down because there's the power square relationship to voltage. So there can be quite sort of good returns in power savings if you can do that. If you're going to start reducing supply levels to optimize, say, your power performance, you need to know where your supply level is quite accurately. And that's why we're seeing strong evolution of voltage sensing circuits coming through, as well as voltage sensing circuits looking at droops on supply when you suddenly have these acute demands on workloads and, and activity within the chip. So Stephen, thermal sensing is also very interesting to me. Uh, can we walk through that aspect as well? Yes, thermal sensing is majorly important, essentially temperature on the die equals power. And what we're seeing is that temperature can be quite unpredictable. It depends on the activity within the chip. It depends on the workloads that are being applied across the chip, take multi-core arrays. We also see that it's very software dependent. And when you design a chip, you cut it with a certain software set and it runs on that chip. But what happens is the software is developed, it's evolved. You get different downloads, different upgrades, you know, whatever you want to call it, but the software is evolving. And to predict fully how that is impacting the chip is, is very difficult. So you can get these changes in temperature. You know, sudden workload is placed on a particular CPU core, it heats up quite naturally. That then can apply thermal stress on the design. Again, it's something that you need to monitor for. And the reason for monitoring is that you can then start to change things like system clock frequencies. So if your chip is working too hot, you can reduce the clock supply down to start cooling the chip. And of course, if your chip is operating at quite a nice temperature, thank you very much, you may as well increase the activity and frequency, get more data throughput, but in a controlled way. That makes sense. Now, what about the accuracy of the sensors? How can this system help us here? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a, one of my favorite points, something that people 
just don't realize is that if you have a chip that's operating in the field and it's starting to to heat up so the junction temperature is slowly starting to rise there's usually a trigger point that set you know either by software or by sort of hardwired sort of trigger point within the firmware or within the rtl itself that says we need to start backing off this temperature so we're going to start to slow the clock down or maybe in some cases we're just going to start shutting blocks down and we're going to shut the chip down in its entirety so the point at which this trigger occurs i.e. your maximum temperature you're you're willing to accept is dependent on a worst case and if you have, say, not so good, not so accurate sensors, product in the field will slow down or shut off early. And, and this is something, you know, I'm quite keen to put over to people that if you can have a more precise judgment on things like thermal conditions within the chip, quite simply, more of your product will be working for longer within the field rather than slowing down or, or shutting off. That makes sense. Now, Stephen, what about power optimization? Can this system also help me here? Yeah, very much so. And as I've, I've referred to earlier, there's a good benefit from reducing the supply in any way, obviously with the margin, because you don't want to start to disrupt the operation of, of the logic. You need to maintain a certain amount of headroom. And that's because of the voltage square law on power. And so there's a benefit to be had there. But this is an example of where a more accurate supply sensor, you can then sort of guard band around the voltage that you're trying to keep operating at those sort of little benefits that you can make those sort of tens of millivolts maybe 100 millivolts of savings really have an impact when you look at overall and lifetime energy consumption of the chip so Stephen, i would think that this kind of life cycle management would be powerful in a lot of different markets and it makes sense that data centers would be at the top of that list uh, would you agree Absolutely. So this takes monitoring to a real world application and data center and high performance computing is, is a very interesting space, mainly because of the scale, scale of the devices, you know, the gate densities that we're talking about and the power that's been consumed. This is all in the context of, you know, it's got to be working reliably during the operational lifetime. So we also target automotive, AI and consumer, but I think data center as one example here is quite a good one to run with. So data center is all about power. Data centers are constrained by power. Power constrains their ability to scale. There's obviously large costs involved when you look at uh, energy and electricity consumption, as well as things like environmental impact on, on CO2. It's all about performance for a given amount of power. And what we're seeing within the data center area is, I believe, something like 2% of global energy is used today for data centers, and that looks to be growing to about 8% in 2030. And those are huge energy consumptions. And when you bear in mind that 40% of the energy consumed by a data center is on cooling silicon devices, that just goes to reflect how important it is to energy optimize and optimize the, the performance of the chip and each and every chip within those data centers. So Stephen, what specific challenges are we looking to solve in the data center arena? Yeah, so there's very much a demand to have uh, highest data computation and throughput as possible. And the limitations to data centers can be the physical power that it demands and the unit cost of electricity. So there can be some influences there on local electricity tariffs. But the real challenge that it has is scalability. Scalability really comes due to how much power you can be providing into the data center. And we're seeing that in that constrained sense, you're having to make the most of the energy that you have available. And so the better sort of computation you can perform for a given sort of unit amount of energy is obviously desirable. And that does have an impact depending on you know, what you're using within each chip, how you're monitoring essentially your power performance and your throughput performance. So this is where it sort of loops back around to very much at the very sort of chip level. It's making an impact at the kind of higher data center level. 
So, Stephen, I would imagine that in-chip monitoring would play a crucial role in device reliability as well. Absolutely. So two things I would say about reliability in a data center context, and that is downtime is expensive. It creates redundancy or redundant capacity that can't be used and hence a lower utilization. The other area is that data centers can become or are becoming more remote. They're being placed into different geographical areas, you know, maybe where there's better sources of energy or lower cost energy. Maybe it's into areas where cooling is a little bit more easy to allow for. And we're also seeing, and you may have seen it sort of in the press, you know, things like uh, submerged data centers, so submarine data centers. And there's uh, one example of, I think, a Microsoft project of the data center submerged off the coast of Scotland, um, which has been running for a few years. So in that context, reliability is super important because they're becoming less accessible to make changes and you know, swap out equipment, essentially. So we're seeing reliability as a growing area in data center in much the same way as we've seen in the automotive space, which is an interesting point to make. Absolutely. Now, what about placing the sensors? Would this type of system help me here? Yeah, so if we bring it back to the sensors and within the chip, strategic placement, how you're placing them around the architecture of the devices is quite important. And this is where we bring in quite a bit of experience. We've been doing this for a number of years, supporting customers in this space. If you take one example, in a data center or a high performance compute application, you've got multiprocessor arrays and really you want to be able to place sensors around each of the clusters of processors or around each processor itself and that then provides you an opportunity to be deciding how you're going to place a workload on a particular processor within the chip itself so it becomes more and more localized how you're regulating conditions. So whereas, you know, maybe a few years back, it had been on a chip level basis. We're now seeing an opportunity to measure, monitor conditions and apply suitable workloads at a very, very localized sense. So what kind of benefits are we talking about in terms of a data center here? By having better sensors, when I say better, I mean more precise, more accurate, more highly distributed, so you can get more localized readings throughout the die, and also lower latency. These little improvements that you can make on power and throughput performance, these little gains do scale up. So decisions made when applying architectures, when developing architectures at the micro level, scales up in terms of savings to the macro level. So we have an example here where if you were to increase the accuracy of your thermal sensing within a device, say by two degrees C, you know, that equates to a, a certain level of power. We have put some assumptions in there as to the size of the data center, but using that model and, and those assumptions, a two degree C better performance in accuracy and thermal sensing would equate to around about $5 million per year, which is uh, not insignificant. Absolutely not. So Stephen, can you explain a bit further how the structures and sensors work together? Yeah, so this is a view of where we're heading and it's going beyond just the traditional PVT sensors and PVT sensors are here to stay. They are critical. Devices won't be able to operate without such technology, but we're seeing that there can be so much more applied here. So new sensors, new structures, different ways of generating data and useful information out of the chip and making that information meaningful that we can then react upon. So more diagnosis within the chip for reliability purposes, looking at functionality. So operation throughout the design, you know, bus transfers, processor performance, looking at margins of operation. And in that context, looking at margins of operation and how low you can bring the core supply down is very much a, a keenly looked at area. Uh, spotting trends over the lifetime of the chip while it's in operation. So trends that may 
that indicate that there may be reliability issues. So you can spot those early. So you can apply a predictive maintenance scheme or predict failure, which is of a huge value to many of the sectors that we work within, in particular automotive. And making an assessment of how the chip is made is just a continual curve which we're pushing down. So essentially, the opportunity there is to generate more information from devices that has impact on its operation throughout its lifetime. All right. Well, Stephen, this was a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? The way I could summarize it, if I'm allowed to just sort of cut through the slide a little bit, is that there are just so many use cases and ways of applying solutions when you're looking at the life cycle of devices. I think this is why the silicon life cycle management has such a huge opportunity and will have an impact, not just at the chip level, but also the product level. And so this is why I'm so excited about what we're able to do in this space over, over the coming years. And I very much look forward to the future and the future development of SLM and how we meet the needs and the challenges going forward, which will be there and continually be there from our customers. Fantastic. Well, Stephen, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. You're more than welcome. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Synopsis. You can also click another link and check out the first episode in this Chalk Talk series. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube youtube.com slash eejournal.